Hi, I'm Andy Jones, Content Editor for Platt's online education program, Let's Paint, and welcome to Color Lessons. Today we're painting endings and beginnings. For all of our color lessons, I'm using Folk Art's Pure Artist Pigment Paint. It's been specially formulated to be very, very thick so that you can use this for a wide range of painting techniques. We can use it thin down for transparent watercolor effects, or you can use it with a palette knife for really thick, rich impasto work. The 20 colors of Folk Art Pure Artist Pigments are available at platonline.com forward slash let's paint. And in the set, there is also a great color theory worksheet that is specially coded for you to paint on and reuse if you'd like to. And this is included in the kit with the 20 colors. So this is a great color theory booklet, and we also support this with an online video. I'm also using the Folk Art Pure Artist Pigment Mixing Mat, and this is a great tool to use in place of a palette. It's a reusable silicone mat, and it has spaces to put your colors out around the edge of the palette. Part of it is gray, so that you can see exactly what value of colors that you're using. Part of it's white, so that you can see how transparent a color is. It also has a quick guide for color harmonies, as well as a little vocabulary list so that you can keep yourself familiar with color theory terms. This is a great product, and I think you'll really enjoy using it, and you can use it over and over and over. It cleans off beautifully and does not stain. For all the color lessons, I'm using the Folk Art Select Firm Bristle Brush. These brushes have been designed with a firm bristle synthetic filament, and it is great for canvas painting. It will stand up to lots of abuse. With care and cleaning, these brushes will last you a long, long time. They're perfect for canvas painting, as well as any other kind of fabric painting that you're going to do. I think you're really going to love these Folk Art Select Firm Bristle Brushes. They're available at platonline.com forward slash let's paint in a package of seven beautiful brushes. Some of you are concerned that you can't draw. Well, we've got you covered because we're teaching you how to paint, not how to draw. The color lessons come with a package of full color photographs so that you have a complete uh, set of all of the photographs for all of your color lessons paintings. In addition to that, we have full size pattern sheets. So they're uh, printed out for you so you don't have to enlarge anything and you can transfer the designs directly to your canvas. So these also are available at platonline.com forward slash let's paint. Today we're going to be painting a simple still life of a vase with some dried hydrangeas and a bird's nest with a couple of eggs in it. I painted this on a 16 by 20 clear primed linen canvas. And I think the clear primed linen canvas is the most incredible background. Uh, there's nothing that quite looks as good as the Belgian linen actually being just a simple background for your painting. I have transferred my design to the canvas using gray artist transfer paper, and the design is available in the Color Lessons pattern sheets, which you can order at platonline.com forward slash let's paint. And you want to be able to just barely see the lines that you've transferred on your canvas. So be sure not to transfer a dark, heavy outline. It just is more difficult to cover up and will cause you more work later on. So uh, transfer your uh, pattern as faintly as you possibly can. And we're going to begin today's painting by painting the main bright item in our still life, which is this stoneware pitcher. If you look on my palette, I have titanium white, I have ultramarine blue, I have Prussian blue, I have yellow light, I have medium yellow, and I also have Payne's Gray. And these are all Folk Art Pure Artist Pigment paints. They're a very, very heavy bodied, thick paint, which works beautifully for canvas painting. If I need to thin my colors or make it more transparent, I use Folk Art Floating Medium, and I'm going to just put some in a little portion cup that I have here on my palette, so I'll know exactly where my floating medium is, and it doesn't uh, encroach on any other colors on my palette. I'm going to begin by making an aqua color, so I'm going to take a portion of my white paint and move it to the side. And 
And every time you move paint, please make sure to clean your palette knife on a blue shop towel so that you don't contaminate other colors of paint. Now I'm using ultramarine blue and Prussian blue. Um, you can use more or less of either color. Ultramarine blue is a very clean, what I call like a patriotic blue, and it's going to give you um, a very light kind of sky blue color, and Prussian blue is a blue that has a bit more green in it, and it's a bit more intense. So I'm just using a combination of these two blues to create a nice mid-value bluish color. I'm going to add a little bit more ultramarine blue to this mix. And then we're going to make it a bit more aqua by adding some yellow. And if you wanted your pitcher uh, to be a cleaner blue, you could use a less Prussian blue if you wanted to. I just liked the idea of this kind of aqua uh, colored stoneware. So I'm going to add just a little bit of medium yellow to my blue mixture. And we'll see how that looks. I also have yellow light out on my palette, so I can use a combination of the two different yellows. And by having the different colors out on my palette, if I want to pick up some color with a brush and mix that in, I can alter my color very easily just by brush mixing. So I'm going to add a little yellow light to this. And there we're getting a nice kind of aqua color, not too blue, not too green. But make sure to thoroughly mix your paint. You can see I've got a little bit of unmixed yellow in there and you don't want that. You don't want any surprises when you go to your canvas. All right, so this is going to be kind of the mid-tone or the local color of my pitcher. So I'm going to set my blue shop towel aside, set my palette knife aside and it's clean ready to be used when I'm ready to pick it up again. I'm going to be using a Folk Art Select Firm Bristle Brush, and I have a one inch flat brush that's a pretty good size brush for the size picture that we're painting. There's no need to add water to your brush or to your paint. Simply pick up the paint, and we're going to begin to block in our picture. So push the paint from inside the design right along to the outside edge, making sure that your pitcher is nicely rounded. And then I'm just going to begin to fill in my pitcher with this aqua blue color. And you don't want to put a huge, heavy amount of paint on. You want to be able to cover your background pretty easily and not really stretch the paint out too much. So put on a nice amount of paint, but not an excessive amount. And then I am going to make sure to carry this color up into uh, my flower area. And I want to make sure that that is a broken line of color so that whatever might be showing through my hydrangeas as we paint that later on in the lesson, uh, we can cover anything up that we need to. So just a broken line up here where our flowers will be hanging over the vase. And we're just going to continue to apply this color to the vase. And again, when you come to the outside edge, just start inside and push that color right up to your design line. creating a nice, clean edge. You want to make sure to take your time and paint your vase nicely so that you don't end up with a misshapen vase at the end of the painting. So carefully follow your design line. The Folk Art Pure Artist pigments have an extended drying time, so there's going to be plenty of time to apply shading and highlighting to our vase before we need to worry about the paint 
beginning to dry out. So again, just keep applying the paint to the vase and then stretch it out. You want just enough to give you give yourself a nice coverage on your canvas. Okay, have the main part of the vase filled in pretty well. And now we're just going to do the same thing on the handle of the vase. Again, start inside and push your paint next to the design line. That way you end up with a nice clean edge. And we're going to do the same thing on the other side of the handle. and then simply fill in the handle. And we are ready to begin to add some shading to our picture. So I'm going to wipe my brush on my shop towel. I want to fold the shop towel over the brush and gently pull to remove the excess paint from the brush and to groom the brush back into a nice flat shape. So for the shading on the picture, I'm going to pick up a mixture of ultramarine blue and Prussian blue and just brush mix those colors together on my brush. And I'm going to begin over here in the darker area of the vase. This is my light side over here, and this is the side that's in a bit more shadow. So I'm going to begin almost at the six o'clock mark on the vase and coming around the dark side, not quite to the outside edge, but this is where the vase is going to be darker. So I'm patting some dark color on, and then where the vase has a indention in it, I'm going to apply some extra dark shading right there and let that come in a little bit and carry that over toward the dark edge of the vase. All right, so now I'm going to begin to blend and soften this together. So I'm going to wipe my brush off on my shop towel again, fold the paper towel over, pinch and wipe, and then we're going to begin to just pat and move this color around to soften the dark color into the medium color. And you don't have to rush this You'll have plenty of time to blend and soften this color because the Folk Art Pure Artist pigments allow you the opportunity to blend your paint without it drying on you too quickly. So again, just lightly move the color around using a gentle patting motion. And if you should start to move color where you don't want it, simply wipe the brush on the shop towel and continue to blend. You need to pay attention to what you're doing so that you're not over blending or moving the color into an area where you don't want it to be. And this blending does not need to be perfectly smooth or soft. We're just merging the color around to create a nice transition from medium color to darker color. And this is not the final dark color we're going to put on here. This is just the initial establishment of a dark area and then to help create uh, this form of the vase by having this area seem to bulge more and for this area to recede a little bit. So I'm just going to continue to blend and soften this color right up next to the edge of my pitcher.
you're going to have plenty of time to work with your paint because as I said, the Folk Art Pure Artist Pigments will allow you the time to do that because of their extended open time and workability. So you could just continue to soften this. And if it feels a little bit sticky, that's okay. The paint's still going to work for you. You'll know when your paint has begun to dry if you begin to lift or pull paint off of the surface. As long as you can move the color and it's not lifting or pulling on you, then you still have plenty of time to work. So I think this is going to be okay for its initial application of a darker shade. And I do want to uh, separate where the vase handle uh, meets the main body of the vase. So I'm going to pick up a little bit more Prussian blue and ultramarine blue on my brush. Still have not added any water or any medium to this. And I'm going to apply some dark color on the handle right where the vase drops behind there and a little bit where the vase is going underneath the leaf forms. Again, wipe my brush and then I'm going to begin just to softly blend this. And this is a casual still life. It does not have to be perfectly blended. You should be able to see some brush marks and the evidence that this is hand painted. We are not striving for uh, any sort of realism here at all. All right, I'm going to add additional dark down in this portion of the uh, base. So once again, I'm going to pick up a little ultramarine blue and Prussian blue. But I'm also going to introduce a little Payne's Gray into my mixture. And Payne's Gray is a beautiful, transparent blue-gray color that's almost black. So I'm just adding a little Payne's Gray here to deepen that color a little bit more. And we may come back and do this a second time. But to begin with, I'm just going to apply some of this rich, dark color in the darker area of my vase. And I'm going to begin just to work this color on the vase and begin to smooth it in a little bit. And I'm also gonna put a little bit right in here where I want the vase to recede. Wipe my brush on my shop towel by pinching it between the shop towel. That's gonna take the excess paint off my brush and groom the brush back to a nice flat edge. And now I'm just going to soften this color into the vase. Just patting and softening it, creating a nice transition between the dark color and the medium color. And as I move color where I don't want it, I'm going to wipe my brush and then continue to come back and softly blend this. This is not the end of the dark color on the vase. We're gonna come back and put some more on a little bit later. We're just getting the base tones of the vase established at this point. All right, I'm gonna pick up some of my initial color on my brush. Just pick that up, no water, no medium, just a little bit more of the initial color. And I'm just going to soften that in just to make my blending a little bit easier. To wipe that color off the brush and just soften where the darker color meets that medium color. And this is something that you'll need to play with a little bit until you're very, very comfortable with the idea of layering color on and then softly blending it. Do not strive for a completely smoothly blended base. Uh, if you try to do that, you're going to set yourself up for a little frustration. We just want our colors to be nicely merged together and to have a smooth transition, but there are visible brush strokes. So I'm just putting a little bit more of my medium color on 
and I'm just going to blend that in. Just a little bit, just trying to neaten up this edge just a little bit. I want to add a little bit of an accent uh, to this mid area of the vase. So I'm going to pick up some of my base color of the vase, which is my light aqua color. I'm going to brush a little bit of that on. This is just giving me a little additional working time. And into this, I'm going to blend a little bit of medium yellow or yellow light. Just going to brush mix that here making my aqua color just a little bit more green. And I'm just going to add a little bit of that color right into my transition area. I think that's a nice, fun accent on here. And I'm just patting it in there, softening it just a little bit. This makes the vase not just a blue vase or a blue pitcher, but it gives it a little bit more interest because this color is going to be repeated in the hydrangeas that we're going to do a little bit later in the lesson. Just keep moving the color around until you're happy with the overall appearance. And then when you're pretty happy with the way it looks, you can, of course, stop blending and let this dry. I think this is a pretty good time to pause the video once you have your vase established to this level. Okay, we have our uh, jug or vase that's been painted. It's now nicely dry, and I'm going to move on and do a little bit of work on my bird's nest. So I'm going to add a little bit of burnt umber to my palette. I'm going to use a number 12 flat brush and I'm going to pick up some burnt umber on my brush, no water, no medium. And I'm simply going to paint in kind of the inside of the bird's nest. I'm going to paint around the eggs. and then just kind of fill in here in the background a little bit. I'm just gonna stretch this paint out. I don't need as much burnt umber over here on this right-hand side of the bird's nest inside. Just stretching that color out a little bit. And I'm just using long, smooth, vertical strokes to kind of soften that paint onto the canvas. I'm going to pick up a little Payne's Gray in with my Burnt Umber to darken that color a little bit more. And starting on the left side of the bird's nest, I'm just going to stroke some of this darker color on to create some shadowing in the back of the bird's nest. And you can see that the shadowing is much darker on the left-hand side, and it's much lighter over here on the right. I'm gonna wipe my brush thoroughly on my shop towel. I'm going to pick up a little bit of my aqua color that we used to undercoat the vase. And I'm putting a little bit of paint on my brush, working it in to the bristles pretty thoroughly. Don't want a lot of excess paint on the outside of my brush and I'm going to apply a little bit of an accent inside the bird's nest over here on the right-hand side, touch my brush to the surface and pull down, and I'm gonna do another one. So I'm gonna pick up a little bit more paint and I'm going to touch my brush and pull down. So I've created two accents of aqua inside the bird's nest, and now I'm going to undercoat my eggs with a mixture of ultramarine blue plus a little bit of Prussian blue and a small bit of the original aqua color 
on our vase. Now, if you want your eggs to be more aqua, certainly use more aqua. If you want your eggs to be more blue, then use more ultramarine blue and Prussian blue. The choice is entirely up to you. So then I'm going to carefully base coat the eggs with that, my blue color, making sure that the eggs stay nicely rounded. You just don't want to have eggs with flat edges. I'm going to shade my eggs or darken them by using a little Prussian blue and Payne's gray. And I'm basically picking that up just on one half of the brush. So I have stronger color on one side of the brush and then I just let that color fade off across the bristles of the brush. So I'm going to shade where the egg goes underneath the front part of the nest and where one egg sits behind the other. darkening the back egg where it goes behind the front egg and then where it disappears behind the front edge of the nest and then lightly blend to soften. And I'm going to do the same thing on the front egg, except this time I only need to worry about where the egg goes behind the front of the nest. Just pat that dark color on. Then I'm going to wipe my brush and blend to soften that color into the blue of the egg. To highlight my eggs, I'm going to shift to a number 10 filbert brush. And a filbert brush is shaped like a flat brush, except it has no corners. It has a rounded end to it. And this is going to allow me to apply some highlights to the eggs so that I don't end up with harsh corners. So I'm going to pick up a little bit of titanium white on my brush and just a little bit of the aqua color that we painted the eggs with. So just mixing that together, making a lighter shade of blue right on my brush. And I'm going to take the excess paint off of the outside of the brush. I'm just going to barely wipe the brush on my shop towel and I'm going to apply the highlight where I want the color to be the brightest. I'm going to apply a little bit of a highlight right there and also here on the front egg. So I'm going to wipe the color off of my brush and I'm just going to come in here and just kind of tickle the outside edge of that highlight, softening it into the egg. It's going to be fine if you leave some brush marks showing. I'm going to add a little bit more highlight to this front egg just by picking up a little bit more titanium white on my brush and applying that, wiping the excess paint off of my brush and then softening that just to create a nice highlighted area on the egg. You could still see some brush marks and that's going to be perfectly fine, but I am going to come back now with a bit more titanium white and I'm going to lay on a little bit brighter highlight Just stroke on a little highlight. You don't want it to just to look like one little dab of color there. So you might want to make a couple of little strokes just to kind of soften that in a little bit. But that's all we need to do to our eggs at this point. All right, let's go back to our number 12 flat brush. And we're going to begin to form our bird's nest. So I'm going to take some burnt umber plus a little bit of our Payne's Gray mixture, making that a nice dark brown color. 
and I'm going to lay the foundation of our bird's nest on. So it's a nice, rich, dark brown color. And don't try to make your bird's nest smooth and round. Let's have this bird's nest have some fun, sharp angles to it. We've got more to add to this bird's nest, but if we can begin to establish kind of interesting angles and an interesting shape to our bird's nest, we'll be better off in the long run. And some of this can come right across the front of our pitcher, establishing that the bird's nest is in fact sitting in front of the pitcher. Okay, so that's establishing our bird's nest. And I want to establish the shape of our hydrangea flowers. So I'm going to pick up a little burnt umber on my big one inch flat brush. And I'm also going to add a little bit of yellow light to that. So here on my palette, I'm just brush mixing some burnt umber and yellow light. And I am going to dip the corner of my brush into some folk art floating medium because I want this color to be a little bit transparent and I want it to move really easily for me. And I'm going to begin to establish the flower forms. So I'm going to start using the corner of my brush and I'm just scratching some of this dirty uh, brownish green color on. And I do not want to paint uh, lollipop or puffy cotton ball rounded shapes for my hydrangeas. They need to have interesting outside edges so that when the viewer looks at your painting, it holds their interest. Uh, a simply a round shape is not going to interest your viewer for terribly long. So this little hydrangea flower form back here, I'm gonna add a little bit more burnt umber to my brush and brush that on so that it's a little bit darker. Still pretty transparent. But we're just brush mixing burnt umber and yellow light and adding some floating medium to make the paint move very, very easily and to make the paint a bit more transparent. So I've got a flower form that's over here on the brighter or light side of my painting. So I'm going to establish a little bit of dark behind the central flower form. And then I'm just going to scratch and move some of this color out making sure that I have an interesting outside edge to my flower form. Some of this is going to still be seen when we're done. Some of it's going to be completely covered up. We're just basing in a little bit of color so that we know where our flower forms are going to be. So I've got another flower form that is in shadow behind our main hydrangea flower. I'm just adding some extra dark back in there. And then I'm just scratching and softening this color out, stretching it across the flower form. Again, brush mixing some burnt umber and yellow light. And this just creates a very dull kind of green color. That's very much like the color of dried hydrangeas. So on this main flower form, I'm going to just brush some color over mostly on the right hand side of this flower form and then stretch that color from the dark side across to the lighter side of the flower form. There's going to be almost no paint on the light side of my flower form and then more color on the dark or shadow side of the flower. So we've now established our base our bird's nest and our flower forms. And let's go ahead and paint in our leaf forms. And I'm going to do these very quickly because I want you to do them very quickly. 
because they are definitely not the focal point of our painting. I'm going to brush mix a little bit of medium yellow, a little burnt umber, and a little ultramarine blue, kind of making a nice dull dark green color. And I think I want my color to be a little bit darker, so I'm just going to add a little tiny bit of Payne's Gray to this. So now here on my palette, I've mixed a very nice dull green color and a darkened value. I'm going to wipe the excess paint off my brush. I'm going to pick up a little floating medium to help make this color a bit more transparent and to help it move on the canvas a little bit easier. So I don't want more, much paint on my brush. So I'm going to wipe a little bit off, just taking the excess paint off. And I'm going to use the corner of my brush to begin to establish the leaf form. And I'm just going to scrub this color back in toward the flowers. And then just a little scrubbing motion out to create a leaf shape. Doesn't need to be any more defined than that. We are going to come back and add a little extra dark color to it. But down here, I'm going to do the same thing. Start at the bottom of my leaf form, take the excess paint off my brush, and then scrub that color out. And just let this be very, very suggested. Don't be terribly obvious with your uh, leaf form. All you need to do is to give the viewer of your painting an indication that there are leaves there. They'll figure it out. Green areas next to flowers equals leaves, and you don't have to say any more than that. So I'm gonna pick up more Payne's Gray and just brush mix this into that area on my palette, making a darker green. I need to add a little bit more medium yellow to that. And establish a little bit darker area at the base of the leaf form. And that's all we need to do. I think oftentimes when people are painting something, they think they have to paint absolutely every little bit of something so that people know what is being shown to them. And people can figure things out. You don't have to um, beat them over the head with it. Just you know, an indication of a leaf shape in a green color and a floral painting, and people will assume that it is some sort of foliage. They don't care what, it, what kind it is, just a little bit of green is all they need to see. So I've established three leaf forms back here, and I can come back and take some of our original uh, color that we put here on our vase or jug and just pick up a little bit of color on my dirty brush. It didn't add any water or any more floating medium to this. And you can add a little bit of a highlight there or here. If I want to really kind of lift one leaf form off of the other, that creates um, the contrast between light and dark and that really separates um, the leaf forms. And just to repeat the color a little bit, I'll add some up there. But really this is all I need to do uh, to establish the leaves and the flower forms. And while we are establishing forms, I'm going to put some Napful Crimson on my palette. And I'm going to begin to establish this drape of fabric that is laying on our tabletop. So I'm going to wipe my large one inch flat brush thoroughly on my shop towel. and then pick up the naphtha crimson on my brush. And I'm just going to block in the swath of red fabric. I'm gonna come right next to the vase. And just use the chisel edge of my brush to establish the outside edges.
and then use the broad surface of my brush to pat this bright red color on. And there's plenty more we're going to do to this, but we're just establishing the mass tone of our fabric. And I'm going to do the same thing on the left side of my canvas. Once again, just establishing the outside edge of the canvas is in the chisel edge of the brush. And then fill in the fabric using the broad side of the one inch flat brush. Once again, you really just want to work and stretch this paint out onto the canvas. Work it into the weave of the canvas. Oftentimes people ask if I continue the painting around to the edge of the canvas. Sometimes I do, most of the times I don't. Um, I think it's just easier to try to leave the edges of your canvas clean, especially uh, with something like this where there's just basically paint that comes off in two areas. Um, you know, if you have an overall background on your painting, you of course can carry the painting off to the edge, but when it's something like this, I probably wouldn't bother doing that. It is of course completely up to you. Uh, if you want to, you certainly can. Uh, a gallery wrapped canvas does not require a frame to finish it, so treating the edges is a matter of personal taste, and I will leave that up to you. All right, still just working to apply the naphthol crimson to the canvas. And that color is such a vibrant primary red color. It's incredible. Okay, so that basically establishes our red areas of our fabric. I'm not going to bother to paint any in here in the center because we're going to cast a very strong shadow from our bird's nest into this area. So you wouldn't see the red anyway. So no need to paint it and then just try to cover it up. So at this point, we have basically massed in our colors on all of the elements of our still life painting. This would be a good time to pause the video and dry everything. And when we come back, we'll establish more darks, begin to establish the highlights and the details on our bird's nest. We are back and our entire canvas is thoroughly dry. So we are going to begin by applying the darkest darks on our vase. I'm going to use some folk art floating medium as a glazing medium. And I'm going to apply a thin layer of this to the darkest areas on the vase. And I'm going to spread that out, creating a nice thin layer of medium on my surface. And I'm doing this so that I will have a wet surface in which to blend my darkest colors. So a nice application of folk art floating medium there. And I'm going to pick up some Prussian blue and Payne's gray on my brush, creating a very, very dark color. And I'm going to apply that within the very darkest areas of the vase. And the floating medium makes this very, very slick and very easy for me to soften out the dark color into the vase. So just applying it, I'll take the excess color off of my brush by pinching it between my shop towel, and then I can simply soften and smooth that color 
as much as I need to. But I do want to leave it very, very dark in the darkest parts of the shadow. As you're working on this, you'll want to work relatively quickly because the folk art floating medium does not extend the working time of your paint. Folk art blending gel will extend the drying time, but the floating medium doesn't. It just gives you a great uh, slick surface on which to apply some extra dark shading. So I'm applying a little bit of floating medium here on the vase and I will add some extra dark color in this little recessed area, giving the vase a little bit more of a dip, and just soften that color out. Remember, you don't have to blend all of your brush marks away. Seeing that this is hand-painted is part of the charm. All right, so you can see I've got a nice dark area there and much, much darker color down here. I'm going to add a little bit of extra dark shading right here on the handle where it joins the main body of the pitcher or jug. And then I'll just soften that up a little bit. Again, it's perfectly fine to see some brush marks. I think many times people are afraid to allow something to look completely hand painted. They want to remove all of the brush marks and make it look almost machine done. We're trying to be just too perfect with it. Let some of those brush marks show. Let people know that you actually painted the whole thing, that it's not some sort of sticker or decal. Okay, we're going to move on to adding the shading to our fabric, and I'm going to apply a little bit of Folk Art Floating Medium right onto the red, and there's a little bit of the blue shading that was on the vase that colors in my brush, and that's perfectly fine. I'm not going to worry about that at all. Just brush some on. It's going to create a nice slick area to blend into, and I'm going to pick up Folk Art Pure Artist Pigment Alizarin Crimson, and I'm going to deepen that Alizarin Crimson with just a little bit of Payne's Gray making that color a little richer and a little darker. And I'm going to add this dark color right next to the vase. And then I'm just going to soften that color out, moving away from the vase, kind of top the little illusion of a fold that we have in our fabric. And that illusion's not going to really show up until we come back and highlight in a later step. But you can see how I've got some nice dark color there. I've got a little bit of this alizarin and Payne's gray shading on the vase, and I'm going to take care of that in just a minute. But I'm going to continue uh, deepening this little swath of fabric before I clean that off. adding some of that very, very dark color right next to the vase. And then I'll add a little bit down here and just soften that color out. So to clean that small area on the vase where I got the red shading on there and I don't want it there, I'm going to use a clean number 12 flat brush and I'm picking up some folk art floating medium on the brush and I'm just going to use that as an eraser. So I'm going to set the brush down right where I, the offending color is and just very quickly just clean that color right out. It lifts that right off and I haven't had to do anything more than just stroke along the area where the color went where I did not want it to go. So correcting a problem in your painting doesn't need to be a big involved process. That was pretty easy and painless just to get rid of that extra dark red. Okay, so we've got a bit of fabric over there and we're going to do 
the same thing. I'm going to take the excess paint off of my brush and I'm going to pick up some folk art floating medium and we're going to apply it right next to the bird's nest. And then we'll work that folk art floating medium out across the fabric. This is going to give me a nice, slick, wet surface to blend my shading color into. Okay, now I'm going to load my brush up with the alizarin crimson and a little bit of Payne's gray, just like we did on the right-hand side of the canvas. We're going to do on the left-hand side. And I'm going to apply this dark color right next to the bird's nest. And it doesn't matter if I get a little bit of this color into the bird's nest, because this really dark red and that dark brown, you're not really going to see the edges there like we did on the vase. So just picking up a little bit more paint. And on this side, we've got a fold at the top of the fabric and at the bottom. So I'm just going to carry a little bit of shading above the fold and soften that in. Again, it's perfectly fine to have brush marks that show. And then we're going to repeat this down at the bottom of the fabric, just starting and carrying that color across. And you can see how this is beginning to establish that lighter streak through the center of the fabric. Just soften this back the other direction. and then paint from the bottom up. And you're still gonna come back and add a highlight to the center section, but at least we've got this nicely darkened above and below our fold and right up next to our bird's nest. I'm going to create a little bit of the shadow that is cast by the bird's nest. So I'm picking up a little burnt umber and Payne's gray on my brush. It'll be mostly Payne's gray, but I didn't bother to wash or clean out my brush. And I'm going to add this right next to the bird's nest and underneath the nest. And this is going to fill in this area next to the pitcher and the bird's nest. So this just adds that dark shadowy area between the nest and our pitcher. So at this point, we should let our painting dry, and then we will come back and begin to paint our bird's nest, add some additional accents on our pitcher, and we'll begin to paint our hydrangeas. So at this point, again, let's pause our video and let our painting dry completely. Okay, we have dried our canvas completely. So everything that we have on there is locked into place. And I think I'm going to start now by applying a nice bright highlight on my pitcher. So I'm imagining that this is a nice glazed stoneware pitcher. So I'm picking up a little folk art floating medium on my number 10 filbert brush. And I'm just going to roughly dampen the general area where I want my highlight to go and I'm dampening a larger area than my highlight will actually be. And I'm going to take a little Folk Art Titanium White on my brush, 
and I don't want too much. I want a small amount to start out with, and I'm just going to take the excess paint off the outside edge of the brush. And so my highlight's going to go in this general vicinity, so I'm just going to begin to scrub a little bit of this color on. And I want my highlight not to be just a spot, but I want it to be an area that has a nice irregular shape to it. So as you can see, I'm just kind of tickling the outside edge, not with any particular stroke, but just kind of rotating the brush around, just creating a nice kind of flared highlight there. It's just stage one. So I'm gonna let that sit for just a moment and I'm gonna pick up a little bit more white on my brush. And again, I'm gonna take the excess paint off the outside edge of the brush, but now I'm going to apply a little bit more paint, a little bit more concentrated paint. And again, just begin to tickle the outside edges of this kind of highlight, just to let that highlight flare out a little bit so that it isn't just one kind of dab or blob of a highlight on there. We want a little bit of an interesting outside edge to that. And we'll come back to that in a little while after that's had a chance to set up a bit. All right, let's add some accents to the handle of our uh, jug. And then on the front edge, we want something there just to kind of reflect a little color and to attract our eye. So I'm mixing a little bit of naphthol crimson and medium yellow, making kind of a dark orange color. And I'm using a number 10 filbert brush. So I'm gonna wipe the excess color off on my shop towel. And right here on the inside of the handle, I'm going to add a little bit of orange right next to that edge. And then I'm just going to kind of touch that brush down, apply a little pressure and stretch that orange color into the handle a little bit. I'm gonna do the same thing over here on the front edge of this pitcher and right down to the bird's nest. Just adding this bit of orange on there. I'm gonna wipe the excess paint off on my shop towel. And then I'm just going to stretch this orange color inward a little bit. and make sure that we don't have a harsh edge there, but that the color is stretched out and creating a soft edge. I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow light to this mixture, making it a lighter, brighter orange color. I'm gonna add a tiny bit of folk art red light to this. And now we have a little bit brighter orange color, and I'm going to reinforce this just tap and press some of that on, stretch it back a little bit so that you've got an interesting little edge there. And we'll do the same thing inside the handle, adding a little bit of bright orange. And this just creates a little area of interest for your eye to kind of pick up. So we're repeating the reds around our painting in a number of different areas. Now I'll go back to my titanium white, and I'm going to leave a nice amount of paint on the outside edge of the brush, and I'm just going to lay in a bit of a highlight here, holding the brush parallel to the surface of the canvas, and just dragging some of this white color on, leaving a nice highlight that is much thicker and brighter. So now we've got a nice bright highlight area on our picture. And I think that's going to be a good look there. So I'm gonna wipe my brush off and set it aside. And I'm going to use a one inch flat brush and I'm going to apply the highlights on my fabric using Folk Art Pure Artist Pigment Red Light. So I'm picking up red light on my brush. I'm not adding any medium to this or any water. This is simply Folk Art Pure Artist Pigment and the color is red light and I'm going to highlight right next to the fold of my fabric, and you can see this nice bright highlight, and I'm just softening it into the shading and away from the highlight in this direction. And 
we were creating quite a bit of brightness right in this area. And on the other side of our canvas, we're going to do this in the edge or the center of our fabric where we have the fold above and below. So starting in the middle of that fold where I want that highlight to be the brightest, I'm just going to lay this very bright color on and then soften it toward the bird's nest. And you see what a nice bright highlight that gives. The red light is a wonderful highlighting color over naphthol crimson. Anywhere you need a bright red highlight, red light is a great color to use. And so we'll just soften this out, come back, and make that a really substantially bright highlight right in the center fold of our fabric. And you don't have to overthink this. Just make sure that your highlight is brightest right in the center. Really laying that color on pretty thick and then letting it trail away in either direction. Just that simple to highlight that fabric. And this really does begin to bring your painting to life. Next, we're going to add interest to our bird's nest, and we're going to do two different things. I'm going to put some burnt sienna out on my palette. So I want a nice uh, rusty red color for my bird's nest. And we're going to apply some of these lighter elements with our uh, metal blade palette knife. So I'm going to load just one edge of my palette knife with some burnt sienna. And then I'm going to set my knife down on the canvas and I'm going to let a line of this burnt sienna just drag off, creating a little bit of a twig-like effect. And I can do it back here at the back. Just lay on a little bit of a twig. So I have paint just on the back side of my palette knife and I set that edge down on the canvas and just pull and it lets a little bit of paint just trail off that edge. And we'll lay a few of these on just to begin to establish some of the shape of our bird's nest. And then I'm going to switch to a number 10 flat brush and I'll begin to do the same thing using my flat brush just laying it on and creating some twig-like effects. I don't want to use a liner brush and paint a lot of curvy, wavy lines because I want my bird's nest to have a more angular look to it. And I can go right back through what I had applied with a palette knife and just stretch that paint out a little bit more. So just creating some overlapping little twig effects. And you can take your time with this. This doesn't need to be done in a hurry. Don't have to rush through this. Just laying this on twig by twig and we will create a very interesting bird's nest effect. Some of these can cross each other. But we just like the bird, we're building it twig by twig, bit by bit. I'm going to change colors and begin to use some burnt umber and a little bit of Payne's gray. That's kind of the darker shading color we had. So some burnt umber and Payne's gray twigs in our bird's nest. If your paint seems like it's not going to flow off of your brush, you can add a little bit of floating medium just to make it a little bit slicker. Just mix it in to your little puddle of paint on your palette and then you can add some of these darker twigs.
and we are going to come in and add some highlighted twigs to this. But I just want to put a few more of these really dark pieces on here and let some of them really break away from the outside of the bird's nest. Okay, I'm going to rinse my brush in water. This is my number 12 flat brush, rinsing out the dark brown color. And I'm going to pick up some of the original color that we added to our picture when we started. So that's that kind of nice aqua blue color. I'm going to thin it down just a little tiny bit with some water so that it flows nicely off my flat brush. And we're going to use this blue to add some highlight twigs to our bird's nest. So again, using the chisel edge of the brush, just touch the brush to the surface, and you can see just how easily these lighter twigs go on. These really do begin to add a lot of interest to the nest. And I'm going to add some titanium white to this color, just to add a few very, very bright highlights on these twigs. It's still going to be a very, very pale aqua color. And we'll just add a couple of really bright light twigs on here. And again, these are not really curvy, twisty marks. All right, I think that's plenty on there. And now let's turn our attention one more time to the picture and really let's add some extra dark color in here. So as we did before, just adding another layer of color on here, I'm going to pick up a little bit of floating medium on my brush. And I'm just going to brush a little bit of that floating medium on here just to establish an area to blend in some straight Payne's Gray. I'm going to scrub that color on. I want that to be very, very dark. And I'm not going to try to stretch it beyond the bounds of our dark area. I'm really just intensifying that dark color right here on the vase, and I'm going to darken a little bit at the bottom so that it can really kind of anchor and sit down in the still life. I've still got dark gray to put underneath here, but I want that edge of the vase to be very, very dark. So again, this is Payne's gray, and we're just scrubbing that right along the outside edge and letting it be very, very dark within the darker area of our shading on the picture. And I think now I've got that just about as dark as I want it to be. The takeaway lesson here is that you can continue to apply dark or light color as you need to to make the painting look the way you want it to look. This is just intensifying that darkness in the very darkest area of our picture. And again, go ahead and allow some brush marks to show. Let people see that this is an actual painting. There's something inherently beautiful about the mark of a brush on a painted surface, just knowing that it was 
done by hand, I think is really, really beautiful. Okay, now we have several hydrangea flowers that we need to paint, and we're going to do them in two separate stages. The first stage is going to be to lay in some general background color, much like we've already established, and then we're going to come back with our filbert brush and begin to develop some actual flower petals. I don't want you to begin to think about trying to paint each individual uh, flower petal on here because you'll never be able to do that and it will be incredibly frustrating to try to do that. So I'm taking some burnt umber and a little yellow light and maybe a little medium yellow here. I want to create a dark brownish green color, but I'm adding floating medium so that it is not opaque. I want this to be very transparent because we're just going to use this to kind of stain or tint the white petals of our hydrangeas. So I'm going to begin up here at this top um, flower and I'm adding the dark at the bottom of this flower form. And I'm just scrubbing that color up into my flower a little bit using some floating medium to help stretch that color out. Now I'm going to take my number 10 filbert brush and some titanium white. And I'm going to begin to pick out some flower petals. And I'm putting these marks on, kind of imagining that I'm stroking around a little pin spot of color. Just letting some of that dark color collect on my brush. I'm not picking up new color on my brush very often, just continuing to apply some little stroke-like dabs. If I need to, I can pick up a little more paint and add some generally around the outer edges of my flower form. Letting some of that color kind of show through as I'm just adding little touches to the flower form. Don't want to add any kind of detail whatsoever to this flower. Just adding a few little edges of some petals. And I think that's probably just about all I'm going to do. So the viewer is going to have to kind of fill in the blanks as it were kind of making each little petal um, part of a flower. I think that gives the illusion of a flower there. There's an illusion of a flower there. There's an illusion of a flower up here. But I don't need to do any more, and I want to keep this very, very indistinct area kind of darker and a little bit more mysterious. So that's hydrangea number one done. It didn't really take very much to do that, so now I'm going to take my big brush and adding a little bit of burnt umber, a little bit of medium yellow. I'm going to add just a small, small amount of Payne's gray to this, which is just going to change the tone a little bit. And I'm going to come back here and I'm going to add this kind of mossy gray green color to this very back flower form. I'm going to let that set while I pick up my filbert brush and some titanium white. And I'm going to begin to add some little petal marks here at the back flower form. Just adding some indistinct petal marks. And this flower is set further back than any of the other flowers. So this, I want it to stay darker, and I want there to be fewer distinct flower petals. And it's very difficult to make yourself stop. I keep looking at it and just wanting to play in it a little bit, but I think that's all I need to do there. 
you can look at this and you understand that there is a flower form that's sitting to the back of the um, overall design there. So once again, big flat brush, floating medium, burnt umber, could be medium yellow or yellow light. Doesn't really matter because adding it to the burnt umber is going to give you a little bit of a, a brownish green color. And let's come back in and add some of this color to this flower form here. And then just stretch this out. Set that brush down. Pick up some titanium white on our number 10 filbert brush. And we're going to begin to add some flower petals here. Want to make sure that this edge is set out so that it is much brighter next to the shadow of the um, flower form in the back. So I'm going to move around the perimeter of this flower and where I want to make it come in front of something, I'm adding a little bit more substantial white. And remember, I'm not trying to paint individual flowers. I'm just adding some petal shapes here and there. It's mainly just kind of collecting them around the outside edge. And then as I move in, I'm going to make a few little marks here and there. Trying not to pick up excess white paint on my brush. But letting some of this brownish green color add to the interest of the flower petals as I'm stroking them on. And no two hydrangea blossoms are ever going to look the same. Just impossible to make that happen. And then as I want to, I can come back and add a little bit more distinct uh, flowerette shapes here and there, but still not trying to paint in every one of them. That's part of the charm of this style of painting, is that the viewer gets to fill in whatever you've left for them to look at. So once again, lighter colors at the outside edge, and then I'm letting this area stay darker because it is in shadow behind the front hydrangea. All right, so now you can easily see that we have a flower form in the background. We've got another one back here, and this one is resting in front of it and on top of the leaves. And I'm thinking I need to highlight out here at the edge a bit more, just to really pull this forward and let the leaves recess behind. Okay, I'm gonna force myself to stop. It's not easy but you have to make yourself not overthink and overpaint these little flower forms. These are dried hydrangeas. They've, they've seen their better days. They're on their way out. It's the end of the line for those hydrangeas. Our little birds haven't yet hatched, so we're waiting on the beginning of the new birds. And it's the ending for our hydrangeas. All right, so once again, with my greenish brown mixture, applying that behind the center uh, or main cluster of hydrangeas, and then I'm just stretching that color out, just giving myself a little bit of wet color to play in. I'll pick up white on my number 10 filbert brush, and I'm not adding anything to this white. It's just the way it comes out of the bottle. So I'm going to begin to pick out some flower petals out here at the edge of my cluster of flowers. So I want this to be uh, in front of that leaf form there. And then some light bright petals out here at the edge, making sure that the outside shape of my flower cluster is interesting and not 
just some sort of circle. And again, we're just going to move across this flower form, adding little petal strokes here and there, not trying to paint individual flowerettes. Just want to make sure that my outside edges are interesting to look at. They need to have some variety to them. So in a couple of places, I'm really reaching outside the circle there just to add some additional interest and shape to this flower form. This is so much fun to paint like this because you don't have to make anything look like anything else. We're just creating some little petal shapes in here. Some of them will end up looking like flowers and some of them are just going to be some little light edges here and there and that's what we want. And that's probably all we need to do there. The real key to making your hydrangeas light and airy is to be sure to leave some spaces in between these little white strokes. And like I said, it's very difficult just to leave something alone. I can't do it myself. Just keep evaluating and looking and seeing where I think I really need to come back and stroke on a little bit stronger flower petal. And I'm going to force myself to stop because if I keep playing at it, I will eventually mess it up. And that is not what I want to do. So once again, some burnt umber, some medium yellow, and I've added a little Payne's gray to this. And to get this just a little greener than brown, adding some floating medium to it. And this is adding some variation in the um, overall arrangement of these flowers. So there we go. Some of this greener, dull color, just making it darker on the right-hand side of my flower form and then stretching it out a little bit lighter over on the left-hand or light side of the flower. Okay, there we go. So set that brush down, pick up your filbert brush or number 10 filbert brush and we're going to begin over here on the lighter side of this flower form and we're going to begin to pull some little petal shapes out so that this edge is really raised above the flower form that is sitting behind it. Don't forget we have these little petals that hang down over our pitcher and we need to make sure that they are interesting to look at as well. Just continue to stroke your petals on and some of that greenish color will collect on your brush and it'll make some of these petals have a little automatic shading, which is really pretty. Make sure to move around the flower form so that you're not over painting in any one given area. You're going to need to change the angle at which you're pulling these petals on so they're not all coming from exactly the same area. And now that I've loosely established the outside edge of this flower form, I'm going to begin 
to move across, adding just some loose petal strokes here and there, not covering the entire flower form. It's the same thing we've done on all of these hydrangeas. I don't think the world will ever get tired of a painting of hydrangeas. They're so nice and fluffy and cheerful that people just love to paint them. Again, just stroking on some petals, not trying to paint little individual flowers. Okay, and then once you have kind of some petals established all the way across the flower form, it's time to come back and see if we don't need to try to pull out a few individual flower forms here and there. So you just kind of look and see where something already looks like you've got something interesting going on, and then just try to emphasize that. You don't want to do this everywhere. Just want to pick out a few of them here and there. Don't try too hard. You're just stroking on a little bit of a stronger suggestion of a petal. I think I need one more right there and maybe something over there, but then that's going to be it for this front flower. I said that was going to be it, but it needs a petal or two there. And then let's come back over to this other side and let's add in something going on here. Trying to like just take a moment and evaluate what I've got going on. And this uh, flower cluster obviously has more light, bright, white petals going on because it's to the foreground. And if you need to just emphasize a little bit of a petal, you could certainly do that. You just don't want to come back and emphasize everything. Because if you emphasize everything, then nothing is more important than anything else. And we really do want to have this nice change from these bright white edges here to something much softer here where this flower form is sitting behind this one. And so I think that's probably all we need to do. And before you ask, no, there are no centers in these flowers. Those are all done. So the next thing we're going to do is establish a bit of our table area. And so I'm going to make a mixture of titanium white, Adding a little Payne's Gray. You'll see that Payne's Gray is a really beautiful color. And I want this to be a nice kind of medium gray. So I'm going to add a little more Payne's Gray here and mix that in thoroughly. Remember to mix and push your paint into a pile. Make sure to get all of the color mixed in so that you don't end up with some surprises on your canvas. You stroke on some unmixed color. All right, let's use our number 12 flat brush. And we're going to just establish our gray color on our table. It's kind of the edge of the table here. And it doesn't have to be straight. If you want some variation in this, just brush in a little additional Payne's Gray into your color. And you can continue to apply this to the canvas underneath the red fabric. Just 
just applying this with vertical strokes. Going to add some more Payne's Gray to my brush. Brush mix that in. Going to add some underneath the picture right here. And then again, apply it with light vertical strokes. This is just like the front edge of our table. Then back to our original palette knife mix of color. This is just a suggestion of the edge of the table. Don't make this more complex than it needs to be. Okay, so we've established that. And now we're gonna do two more things. We're going to add a little bit of titanium white over that to brighten this up. So loading up my number 12 flat brush with pure titanium white, and I'm going to set that on and then soften it to either side just a little bit. So created a nice bright white highlight here that trails out on either side. I'm going to do the same thing over here. Create a nice bright white highlight. And I'm just going to soften this and let it trail off. Do the same thing on the other side here. And we'll add one more area of bright white highlight right in here just to really create some nice drama where we have the white highlight next to that dark shaded area. And then we're going to add a little bit more interest. And one thing that everyone always seems to love is a little runny drip of color. And we're going to do that by thinning some white on our number 12 flat brush. Going to thin that with just plain water, making a nice soupy mixture of white. And I'm going to add a little bit of a drip by tapping my brush on the canvas and letting some extra water collect there. If it doesn't drip, I need to add a little bit more water, but you can see it start to move there. And that's exactly what we want to have happen. And I'm going to do another one over here. So just add that bit of white there and you could start to see that that's going to run and drip. If you need to help it along a little bit, you can. And we'll add a very small amount here toward the center of the canvas. And this over here has done its job, so I'm just going to blot that up a little bit using the corner of my shop towel. I can stop this one over here as well. 
usually a little drip, requires a lot more thought and effort than you might originally think. Just coaxing that along a little bit. Blot my brush. Make sure that that's going to run a little bit. And then that's all I need to do there. Come back and add some thicker white right into the middle of that little drip there. And the last thing I'm going to do is to add a little bit of an additional highlight on the eggs in the nest. So I'm taking some white on my number 10 filbert brush and I'm just going to brush a little bit of a white highlight on there, making sure that it's not just a dot, but it's actually a little bit of an area. And so now our highlights on the eggs tend to bounce off of this kind of highlight, which is pretty bright and end up leading your eye up into the white area of the hydrangeas. After further evaluation, my contrast between light and dark in this particular area of the painting is a little too severe. So I'm going to create a bit of a lost edge here and I've applied some folk art floating medium to this area to give me a little bit of a slick surface on which to work. And I'm going to take my one inch flat brush and I'm going to load some paints gray on half the brush and just a little bit of floating medium on the other half of the brush. And I'm softening that here on my mixing mat. And I'm going to apply this and allow the paints gray to deepen the shadow and then come on to the vase. And you can see how this is just softening that edge and making it almost disappear a little bit into the shadow area. I'm just carrying this around the bottom of the vase and softening that out. But this will really help lose the edge of the pitcher into that shadow. If you need to, you can apply a little bit more and just pat that color on and soften it a little bit. But now we've really lost that harsh edge that we had there. And I think that's going to make this a little bit more of an interesting painting there. Just soften that again. And it's fine to have the brush mark show. In fact, I really kind of like that. All right, so there, now that we've added this kind of lost edge there, I think that's settled that down a little bit more and it's actually made our flowers kind of come to the forefront a little bit more. So this concludes our lesson in Endings and Beginnings. Thanks for painting Endings and Beginnings with me. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. Join me next month when we'll paint Sunset Marsh. Thank you.